Hello, I'm Adam Hussain of AH Contemporary Glass, and I'm going to take you on a tour of my gallery, which is called the Blue Door Gallery, first of all today, to show you my kiln form glass artworks. Um, I've been a professional glass artist since 2008, um, and I was uh, graduated in 2008 from Coventry University. Um, this is my second career. Before that, I was a contract catering manager. Um, the panels behind me are my interference design, which is my signature design, which I've won awards for with Craft and Design magazine. And they were also featured in British Vogue magazine in their contemporary home collection. Um, they're constructed of stringers, which are one millimeter glass rods and sheets of glass and then kiln formed. But I'll explain more about that later. Um, so if you'd like to take a closer look, this one's on a transparent glass. So you get the transmitted light coming through from the, the back onto the wall. And this one's on a translucent white glass, which means the light comes from the back, but you don't get no transmitted light going through the piece. Um, this is a recent piece of Coventry, um, inspired by one of my photographs from the top of the council house. And this, what, this panel of glass is made up with sheets of glass, and fritz and powders, but I'll explain more about them later. Um, these are earlier pieces. There was part of my degree show, there was 12, and these are the last three that I just put on the walls because they've been in storage. And these are lusters and uh, dichroic glass on the surface and strips. So this is the Blue Door Gallery, which I normally hire out to emerging artists in Coventry and the West Midlands. Obviously at the moment we're closed because of COVID. Um, so I've just set up my work in here for you today so you can have a better look at it on display. Um, these are wall panels created with glass sheets and glass powders and they were inspired by landscapes for a headline exhibition that I did in the Cotswolds. These are my signature pieces that I love to do. These are my favourite pieces to create. They're my city landscapes which are inspired from my photography. Um, this one's of Birmingham, my hometown, and it was taken from the top of the custard factory, looking down at the city, and then I scale it up with um, drawing abstractly on the glass in felt tip pen, and then I cut the rods, the one metre rods, and I covered the whole panel of glass with rods, and then it's kiln formed. This one's of Manhattan from New York, um, which um, was taken from the top of the Empire State Building. These pieces on the table are currently in stock and on my Handmade in Britain profile page. So if anybody's got any questions or piche about these. These are created from sheets of glass and the one millimeter stringers. Um, and some of them have got dichroic inclusions. Dichroic glass has a male oxide on the surface that transmits one color and reflects another. So it, it actually changes in the light. So it give you like a rainbow effect. This is the largest bowl that I do at the moment. It's about 40 centimeters in diameter, eight centimeters height, and that's 440 pound. You can see it's on a translucent base. So the stripes, when the light comes through, you can see the multicolor stripes coming through the piece. This again is my signature interference design. So it's um, staggered stringers, randomly put with both transparent and opaque glass. So on the surface you'll have, when the light comes through, the transmitted light coming through the transparent glass, and then the opaque glass will, um, create shadows and that becomes the integral part of the piece. See the dichroic changes from purple on this piece to gold, depending on how you view it and the light. This is my, one of my nibble plates range. So um, some people order these for sushi. Uh, this is 90 pound. It's got it's gray and black detail, and then just the strip of yellow, which I think enhances the piece. Um, these artworks are from past collections on, or the end of collections that I've done for specific gallery pieces or gallery exhibitions. 
Um, these ones are called patchwork luster. They have textured glass and luster on the piece. Um, and then it's kiln formed and then slumped. And then the bottom here, I have one of my Heiku range. So I did an exhibition called Heiku, which is a Japanese poem. And a Heiku poem has three sentences. So it's five syllables, seven syllables, and five syllables. So the lines represent each syllable. And that's the last piece from that exhibition that I did a couple of years ago. If you'd like to follow me to the gallery, um, my studio. Uh, there's also this one of London. Um, basically, it's the stringers going horizontally but then I've done these white stringers in the landscape of iconic buildings in London. So you've got Big Ben, the Gherkin, St. Paul's, Tate. So these panels start at 900 pounds and go up to 1,200, depending on the detail of the piece. This is another New York inspired artwork. So this was a photograph that I took from the boat looking at Manhattan. And then again, the same process as I've explained before, I covered the whole sheet with rods, one millimeter stringers, and then it's kiln formed. So it's three layers of glass. It's two layers of three mil sheet glass, and then the stringers are one mil. So it's seven mil in total thickness. These are standoffs that I use. They come in um, three different colors and they hold the glass 20 mil from the piece letting transmitted light go through the piece onto the wall, which is part of the piece. If Simon can just go behind and show the transmitted light. This is my latest commentary piece. Again, taken as the same view as the first piece that I showed you in the block patterns from the top of the council house. And it's called Coventry Blues because obviously blues the color for Coventry. Um, this was going to be entered for White Open Studios, but obviously that would have been cancelled in the summer due to COVID. I'm going to now go into my studio and I can show you around there and I'll do some demos of different bus techniques. So this is the AH Contemporary Glass Studio. I have my kilns at the far end. I have a large kiln that's um, made by Kiln Care in Stoke and the small kiln which I do my small samples in. Um, this is the work area where I normally work and then I've got my messy area at the back and um, where I do all my polishing and then I've got another mezzanine level um, for extra workspace and then at the top I've got my third mezzanine level which has got my office and my chill out space with all my art books and technical books. So the only glass that I use is called bullseye glass. It's um, probably the best glass on the market for reliability and the range of colors and products that they do. It's American firm. Um, and my supplier in England is warm glass in Bristol, but you can also buy it from Creative Glass Guild. And there's a few other places, but um, I always go with warm glass because um, they seem to have the best Dopplers and I'm one of their platinum members. So okay. Hi Adam. Soon. Adam. Hi. What wonderful work and a studio. I just wanted to know before you get into the demonstrations and um, we just wanted to know a little bit about where did you study and how long you've been practicing a little bit about you that would be fantastic. Okay, so in 2004, I was 29 and I was a contract catering manager and um, I decided to go back to university and I did an art foundation at Coventry University for one year art and design foundation. And then within that year, I tried a bit of everything from screen printing to textiles, um, jewelry. And I whenever I was in a ceramic department, I always used float glass, window glass in the kilns. So um, when I decided to do a degree, I did um, a contemporary crafts degree because I was more about the making of a, of a material rather than the conceptual arts like fine art. So I did a con contemporary crafts degree for three years. And in the first year, again, I tried different materials and I always love working with glass. So I went to night school at Wolverhampton for six months to learn cold techniques. And then I went to do a glass blowing course. And then I went down to Wiltshire, which was the liquid glass center then, I think it's called Glass Hub now. 
And I did two extensive courses with kiln forming, um, fusing and slumping. And I just loved that fusing and slumping. So my final year, my degree, um, my partner, Simon, who's filming at the moment, built me a studio at the back of the garden. And I got my first glass kiln. And um, I've just built the beat, my creative business from there. About four years ago, I had to move to a bigger studio and I went over to Birmingham to the Custard Factory um, in Digbeth, um, which is their creative hub. And I had a retail come working studio for a couple of years there, two and a half years. And then I moved my business back to Coventry nearly two years ago where we built this space. So um, Simon designed and built the studio and the gallery. And um, yeah, so that's a bit of background from, from how I've been practicing since 2008 full time. So I've exhibited my high end pieces with the Crafts Council and at various high-end craft shows around the country. So what craft shows have you done in the past since 2008? Um, so I've done Origin uh, with the Crafts Council. I've done Made by Hand a few times. Um, I've done Made Brighton two or three times. And then I've done lots of local um, craft fairs like at the Mac in Birmingham and um, different places around Warwickshire. So, okay. Great, yeah, fantastic. Yes, we'd love to see some of your work. Uh, I mean, you've shown the work, we would love to see some, how you do it. Okay, so here we've got some pieces that have already been fused and slumped. And this was for an exhibition in the Cotswolds I headlined a few years ago. And my work's not very organic normally. Normally it's very um, using the rods. So it's all very geometric patterns or abstract imagery. Um, so this was a bit out of my comfort zone. So I'm going to quickly do a small soap dish like this. And these are things when I do my courses, I do a course for four people weekend courses. So they're quite simple designs to show people who want an introduction into glass, blow, um, glass fusing. So always wear a mask and glasses when using glass. So I'm just going to put this on now so I won't be talking. So you just hold the sieve and you can control how much powder you want on. If you want it heavy or darker, the, more, the brighter the colour, the more powder you put on. So this is a transparent. So I'm gonna start with a light and then work my way to a darker color above. Normally I'll do that a bit neater. So this is a marigold yellow, so it's a bit darker once it's fired. Um, bullseye glass, the colours, they, they always fire differently. So even though this looks quite pale, it will come out quite dark once it's fired. So I'm just building up the layers and these will just all blend up, blend into each other. And then at the top, I'm just going to put an amber. I'm doing this very quickly. Normally, I'd take more time in creating a piece, but just to give you a general idea. So that, that'd be three different colours, from yellow to marigold, yellow to amber. And then there's this tool that you can buy from most from warm glass. And it's called a dot or line applicator. So again, using the powders. So I'm using a brown opal. So you put a bit of the glass powder in. And then can you see this spring? When you move the spring, it puts dots or you can do lines. So you can do finer details. So I'm just doing this very quickly. Like these will be the stalks of a flower. And because I'm using an opaque brown, this will come out darker than the yellows underneath. 
So you can just put randomly, abstractly, as much as you want. Adam? Yeah? Can you create your own colors, mix your own colors, or you rely on only available colors in the market? Um, you can buy the color. So Bullseye Glass has lots of colors, um, but then you can mix those colors as well to create what color you want. So you could mix a green with a yellow and make a different type of blue or whatever. So you can mix them, yeah. So this is just the red opaque and then you can do the little dots. So it's like little poppies. And you can be quite free with this. The more random you are, the, the better it turns out sometimes. So then bullseye glass also do fritz and they're coming three different sizes. So this is core. So fritz are basically just pieces of glass that are broken and you can buy these in all different colors and you can just add these to a piece as well if you wanted to put detail. And then when these are fused, they will be quite bold compared to the powders. And they also come in medium, of course, and then fine as well. And again, these come in so many different colors and that's the fine. And then obviously then you get the powders. So they're the four different grades of colors, um, grades of coarseness that you can get. So, once I've finished with that, I'm happy with that, I'll put it on another three mil piece of glass and then take it over to the kiln carefully and then it would be fused. And you'll fuse it in, first you'll fuse it into a flat piece um, so it all melts together. And then the secondary process is called slumping. So I'll take it out the kiln, put the mold in. I've already cut the piece of glass to a certain size mold in the first process. Put the fused glass on and it's called slumping. And you just take the temperature till the glass lumps into the mold or over a mold. And then once it hits the bottom of the mold, you stop the temperature. So I've got lots of programs in my kiln um, for different size pieces where I know and I've tested when, I, when to stop the slumping process and bring the kiln down in temperature. But I'll show you some examples of that in a bit. Okay, so that's glass powder. So there's loads of versatile things you can do with glass powders and fritz. Um, I don't use them very often, like I said, but people on glass courses who like organic inspirations, flowers and landscapes, they love using the glass powders. Another technique um, that people like to use, or I show my glass courses, is in inclusions. So this is where you trap things in between two sheets of glass and you can use metals, or micro powders, um, metal flakes. So these are bullseye products. Um, so you can get mesh, you can get copper file, um, gold file, silver file, and you can sandwich it in between the glass. So then if you can see that, these are a coaster set that have got copper file sandwiched in between clear bullseye glass. And I love the way the colors oxidize and each one's different, you can't control that. And then on the back, I use these little dimples so they protect surfaces on people's surfaces, tables. And these are with clear, but you can use any color glass. So you could put it on a yellow glass and you would get a completely different feel, different textures, colors. Um, this is off the top of a wine bottle. So um, it won't stay gold because it's only um, gold plated. So it goes like a gray color, but it's really good for um, doing fine detail for flowers and stuff. But these do need to be, like I said, included sandwiched in between the glass. They can't be on the surface. Bullseye also do these silver flakes that need to be included. So you can get nice fine detail. These ones are silver, but they come in all different colors. Micro powders, they're like lusters. You can see this one, it's, it's like a purple. You can see it on the surface of the bowl. You just use a bit of this 
and you mix it with UP UVA glue and you can just then um, brush it on with a paintbrush but it's best to sandwich it again between the glass because if you use it on the surface you will get a luster but it gives you a rough texture on the surface. If you want a smooth texture always use it in between two pieces of glass and you can also sieve these as well like I showed you with the powders but again in between the, the two pieces of glass. Um, this is my professional glass cutter. So this is probably not for beginners, but um, if you get into glass professionally, it makes your life a lot easier. So I do a lot of large circles cutting. And as you can see, you can cut your circular glass, the, the roller blades here that you score with, the metal blade. And it, you can also change the attachment so that you can freehand and draw, score the glass into a certain shape. And this one's if you're working with strips, you change the attachment again. This goes on there and you can do sh multiple strips really easily by sliding it down the pole and get a nice even straight line on the glass. Um, this bit of kit would set you back probably about 600 pound with the board if you were to buy it. Um, on a bulk offer, otherwise you can buy these things separately and build it up slowly. But they're like £150, £150, £200. So yeah, so, um, but, but really worth doing if you're gonna become a professional glass artist to buy one of those. Right. Stringers, these are my favorite. So this is what I'm known for within the contemporary craft world. Um, so there are artists that use them um, um, but I covered, I've always covered the whole sheet with different designs like I showed you in the gallery. Um, these are all my offcuts because I use them so much. So these are, they come in three different sizes. They come in 0 0.5, which is really fine. So you can get some really fine detail with those. And then one millimeter, which is the ones that I use most of the time. And these come in transparent and opaque colours. That's an opaque orange. And this is the transparent turquoise. So, so they're the one millimetre. Then they come in two millimetres as well, which I use sometimes. So obviously they're thicker, you can get more detail. Sometimes people like to use on the glass courses the, the lime green for stems of flowers or branches of trees or the browns. And then they've just come onto the market last year with ribbons. I've only got these in red. I haven't started to experiment with these yet. So these are like flat pieces of glass, flat ribbons. So they're quite funky. I haven't, I haven't got into using those yet. Adam, and then, any questions? Um, yes, I just wanted to know uh, that would you be the uh, would you be showing us the demonstration uh, finishing process of the piece which you had created with the powdered glass? Yeah. Uh, how so, much how, how much time does it take normally to do that? Um, well, normally, like I I did start to put the glass back into the colours, but I just put that into a mix pot now, um, so I don't mix, so you don't um, contaminate each colour with different colours. Um, so that would probably take normally about 10 minutes with more taking more detail and then two processes in the kiln, maybe some polishing, but I try not to polish unless I have to. Would we be able to see, uh, uh, would you put but, that in the kiln for yeah. the demonstration? Would you put that in the kiln so that people yeah. can see that? So, and it's one I created earlier. So these are a few new pieces that I did a couple of weeks ago. So this piece has been fused already. So this is two, two layers of glass, a sheet of clear or bullseye. And then I've cut the glass into different sections and I've transferred my photography onto the glass. I don't know if you can see the, the flowers. So this has already been in the kiln for about 24 hours full fuse up to about 816 Celsius. And then I've taken it out and then when I fuse it, when I've got the kiln full, I'll place the glass, I'll polish the glass, try to not to get finger marks on it, put it onto this mold, 
I've already cut the, to the size of this mold in the first process. And then once I do a slump firing, I take it up to about 638 and then the glass will just slump into the mold. And when it touches the bottom, I'll stop the heat and bring the kiln down slowly in temperature. And then you'll have your form. These two have already been slumped into these molds. So you can see from that. So that, that's the mold for the soap dish. So that would have been slumped in today, as you can see, it fits perfectly. So when I open the kiln, that's what after the slump. Uh, so that'd be the finished product, finished artwork. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, I was just wondering that um, yeah. if we would be able to see that in live, what you're doing, but I think, I guess it will take time, isn't it? Oh yeah, no. Um, so um, kiln form artists fusing and slumping, we always work cold and then the kiln does all the hot work, okay. but it can be in the like smaller pieces, probably 18 hours, a coaster or a soap dish. Um, my larger panels can be in there for 36 hours because you have to take the temperature up really slowly so that it doesn't thermal shock and bring it down once it's reached full temperature. Um, so no, you can't see in process, I'm afraid. But, um, That's okay. I mean, it's so fascinating to see, you know, actually what people see is around in the craft fairs and the shops, but it's, it's nice to see how it is done. So it would have been really good to spend 18 hours and see actually, but I'm, su I'm sure people yeah. don't have that much time. <laughs> yeah, it's quite boring really, <laughs> once it's in the kiln. <laughs> I normally put the kiln on overnight, so when I leave the studio in the evening, I'll put the kiln on, and then when I come back in the morning or in the afternoon, um, be nice and warm in here, and then you'll open the kiln, and that's the exciting part, because sometimes, even though you, you think you know what's going to happen, sometimes you get happy surprises. Um, so with stringers, you can also bend them over a tea light, the one millimetre ones, it doesn't really work with the two millimetre. So be careful, obviously, the you know, next to no flammable materials. Uh, take your stringer and you just put it on the heat and you just put a bit of pressure with your thumb. And as you can see, it's starting to bend and you get a nice right angle. And that's really hot. So always clean it because it'll have a bit of black soot on from the wax. And then you can do some really funky designs with those. It's a coaster with a similar design. So you can bend the stringers and you could you could keep bending them and just adding them next to each other. And obviously you can bend them more into you know, however far you want really. That's quite funky. Would you like to come over to the messy area? So here I have a few tools for polishing. Um, a lot of the time I prefer to hand polish than use machinery. Um, so I use diamond pads because once you cut the glass, if you have any imperfections, um, the, the straighter the line, the better finish you have on the glass, the better the end piece will be once you've fused the glass. So always wet the diamond pads first and it's just a case of getting any bumps out of the glass. There's a little dent there so a little chip and just be careful you don't slip the glass off and onto your hand. And then you just go down to different that was quite coarse, that one. So then you go down to the left core, yeah. and so on. Um, also, I have a little grinder here. So 
<laughs> need to wet that just a little bit in it. Yeah. So you just need some need to be the sponge at the back needs to be wet. And this has got different grades on you can get the grip. Again, making sure you wear glasses. So it's just putting an even pressure, not pressing too hard because the glass will break. But you can actually do curves on, on corners for different designs. Round off corners, which then you can obviously put into your design and then fuse for different designs. So that's, that's quite fun. And I also use sometimes a Dremel with lots of different attachments for grinding, polishing. And I use it most of all to sign my artworks. So I sign my signature on the frontal panels or on the back of bowls. So they're good little tools you can use. Um, I've also got a little bandsaw that you can make like dolly mixtures with the glass by layering it and fusing it. And then you can cut the fused bars of glass and then rearrange them and refuse them again to get like a geometric pattern, which is quite good. So anybody got any questions? Yes, Adam, yeah. we have a couple of questions. Um, so, you know, when you showed the bending with the tea light, it was quite fascinating because I remember as a child, I used to do that with my mum's bangles, you know? Yeah. And, so uh, one of the question is that because you have fired and then slowly cooled as a part of a larger piece for you, but if they had to be used on their own, would they need to be tempered for mm. jewelry, basically? Uh, um, no, it's, for fused glass, you'd just use smaller pieces. I'd use a small kiln for jewelry, but it still needs to be fused because these just snap. Okay. So yeah, so you'd have to fuse them onto a sheet of glass or you could infuse them in between pieces of glass. Okay. Um, so this is quite a simple but effective design, just like a Paul Smith type poster. And it's basically two sheets of clear glass. And then on the surface, I've got my one millimeter stringers. So I just quickly do that. So, so my coasters, I normally do 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So I'm just gonna, I've already measured the glass, so I'm just gonna score it, even pressure, and then just break. Always clean your glass. You don't want any finger marks on it. And then I cut the stringers just to 10 centimeters, and then you just start laying them. You can do these in bulk. It's normally quicker than doing them individually and lay them on. And to stop them from using, I use a um, called Glass Tech, which is a product from Bullseye again. And this would just keep them in place. It won't glue them hard until the next morning if you leave it. So you have to be careful not to knock it. And then you can rearrange them in whichever colors randomly. You can put opaque, transparent ones together, just opaque. You can put them on a white base glass, which brightens the colors more, but obviously you won't get the transmitted light go through. And you just build up the whole sheet with the stringers, um, let them dry, and then you put them on another sheet of three mil and in the kiln. And then when it's fired, you'll end up with a tile coaster, similar to this. And then obviously you can do so many different designs, like I do the cityscapes, which you need a lot of time and a lot of patience. Um, but but um, they're really good to do. And you can also do geometric patterns with the stringers. So this is a bowl I did a few years ago. That's, I've cut the stringers five centimeters, then rearranged them in geometric pattern on the glass, and then they've been kill, um, fused and slumped. This one's actually been polished on the, on the base. 
you can see it's a lot clearer, but normally I like the texture underneath on my bowls, but this one I did polish. So any more questions? Yes, quite a few questions actually. Um, so uh, we'll start with Annie has asked, uh, I think a couple of people have asked this question is that what is the little funnel shaped thing for fine lines called? It's called a dot and line applicator. Okay. You're, and you'll find it um, on warm glass, in warm glass, in the tool section, hand tools. Okay. So, yeah. you know, when you were showing slumping, so what is used? Uh, what material is used for the molds for slumping? Yeah. Can, you, can you use bisque pottery? So it's ceramic. Um, all the molds are up there, but rather than me going up there, I'll show you the one that I've got in the till. So these are bought ceramic molds, which you can use over and over again. So you just need to do a relief of like a bat wash over the surface and then bisque fire it. And then you can use it about 10 times and then you have to do um, back wash all the, all the um, ceramic molds again, which I normally do in bulk, just in one fire and I get them all done. So they're ready for the, when I want to use them next. So ceramic molds, you can either slump into or over. So that one you slump into. And this one you'd slump over. So this is like for a wall light. And then I also use stainless steel molds. So these are for slumping over as well. So you can use, these are really heavy duty stainless steel. And again, again, these would be for a glass wall light. So that makes sense. You can make your own mold with using plaster and flint, um, but you can only use them once or twice. So they're good if you need to do it for a very bespoke uh, private commission um, or a large gallery piece. Um, but as a rule, I generally buy them because you can use them over and over again. And there's such a vast range of different molds and they keep adding to them. So, so it's always good to, to add to your collection. As you can see, I've got many different ones on there and above and in, in cupboards and stuff. So uh, any more questions? Uh, yes, there are quite a few. So um, one of them is what do you use underneath the glass when you fuse it? So, okay. So so I use fiber paper. Some people um, just have big pieces of plaster that back wash, but I use fiber paper. So I line the kiln with this, which is three millimeters. They're doing one millimeter, three millimeter, six millimeter, but I like to use the three millimeter. I think the one millimeter is too thin. And sometimes you see the kiln bricks underneath the glass. It sort of like takes on the, the design. Um, yeah, so I use that. And then if I want to get a finer finish, uh, on top of that, I then use pink fire paper, which is also a bullseye product, which is this. And that gives you a, a smoother finish on the underside of the glass. So, yeah, does that answer that question? I think so. And what glass cleaner do you use? Um, so I mix my own glass cleaner. So I use this alcohol, which you can get in standard from any um, store or from any um, glass supplier. And then I mix a third of that with a third of white wine vinegar and a third water. So um, I wouldn't use bought glass cleaners when working with glass because they're a bit too harsh with the chemicals. So sometimes even though you might have cleaned the glass, once you've fired it, it can leave like a scum mark on it and ruin the piece. So I always mix my own. Fantastic. I, I think it's quite fascinating to see because we obviously, as I said, that we always see in the glass, uh, you know, in the fair craft fairs, all the products and but 
rarely we realize how much work goes into it. So yeah. what's next for you in the next six months? What's for you? So obviously all at the moment, my exhibitions have all been canceled. Galleries are just starting to open up again that supply my, um, that have my work in. Um, so I'm going to spend the summer doing a new collection um, because I've got the time now, which sometimes you don't have the time when you, you know, trying to do shows and I run a gallery as well through the summer. So all those shows have been cancelled. Um, so through the summer now, I'm going to do a new collection and um, I'm just about to do a glass order. Well, I'm just looking at what glass to buy at the moment. And it's going to be an iridized coloured collection. Um, but I'm going to go for more larger statement pieces rather than the smaller pieces. I'm going to go bigger. And um, for some of the galleries that already have my work around the UK. And that will start off my new collection. Then. And what's the price point of your products? Because as you mentioned that people can buy it on Handmade in Britain website. But what is the price point? Let's go back in. So these are products that are artworks that I already have on handmade at the moment, but I'll be adding to these over the coming weeks. Um, these start at £90 for the nibble plates in the interference design. And then these mediums are 220. That's 220. Square ones 240. And the large ones 440. And then over the coming weeks, I'm going to be adding my patchwork lustre to Handmade in Britain, which I just need to do the photography in square in a square mode, so it looks better on the website. And these start from 110 to 160, depending on the size. Um, my coasters, these are £15 each, so they're £90 for a set of six. And I also do the coasters in the interference design, which are £20 each. But I haven't got those, none of those in stock at the moment. I don't really carry a lot of stock unless I'm doing a show or I've got a deadline um, because each piece is bespoke. So, okay. And then the wall panels, the cityscape ones range from £900 to £1,200. That includes the fixtures. Um, and then the landscape ones, they start at £400, including fixtures. My large interference panels, which are nearly half a metre by a metre, um, they're 1300 each. Uh, sometimes I do an offer if someone buys a triptych or, or a duo. Um, and then... This is £650, which is, again, nearly a metre by half a metre. So, And then these are £250 each, the herringbone stripes, including fixtures. Okay, any more questions? Wait, I think, yes, I think um, uh, we only have one last question because Annie could not uh, catch the name of the different papers for under the fusing glass. That's one of the questions okay. we have. So, so ceramic fiber papers, the base, and thin fire papers, the top layer if you want a smoother finish. And they're both, you can buy them both on warm glass. So the thin fire is a bullseye product. The fiber paper you can buy any type. It's not bullseye. We have one more question, actually. One last question. We'll take it. Um, we, you know, when you mention that you turn the kill off when the glass reaches the bottom of the mold, how yeah. do you tell when this point is reached? So that's trial and that's your testing. So once you have a kill, you do lots of tests. You have a program, and in my programmer. I've actually stayed with the kiln and looked through peepholes and saw when the glass is actually in a molten state and actually touching the bottom and then I've worked out how long, but each kiln's different. So even if I gave someone my fire scheduling, they'd use it in their kiln. And because it might be in a different environment or a different make of kiln or even the same kiln, it might react differently depending on the age of it or you know the elements. So yeah, it's, that's trial and error and you have to work that out. Each glass artist works that out individually with their own kill. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Adam. Any last words for our viewers? 
Um, it's a great medium to work with. And um, if you haven't used Glass before, just go and do a short course somewhere, a weekend course. Um, you can come here once I'm open again after COVID and, um, and just try. I tried glass blowing, I tried cold techniques, and I really loved the fusing and slumping, and I decided to pursue that as my career. So just try a bit each glass discipline and, and um, work out which one you, you enjoy most. Great. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much. Next week, we'll be visiting the studio of Eva Radulova, Eradu Ceramics in London. She'll be showing us slip casting techniques and some of her work using Japanese influences. Goodbye for now. Bye. Bye.